Uh, let me now introduce uh, Ms. Mitchell, Stacey Mitchell, for your testimony. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Byer, Ranking Member Lee, Senator Klobuchar, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to this important hearing. Uh, I am the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Several years ago, I set out to study a crucial question, what's killing America's small independent businesses? In the 1980s, businesses with fewer than 100 employees accounted for 40% of all business revenue. Today, their share has dropped to 20%. And this trend has been accelerating. In the last decade, we've lost tens of thousands of small retailers, distributors, manufacturers, and more. The story that we've long told ourselves about the decline of small business is that they can't keep up. We assume big corporations are inherently better and more efficient, but in fact, research shows that in many sectors, independent businesses outperform. They deliver better products, cheaper prices, and more innovation. The real answer to what's killing small businesses is rooted in policy choices. 40 years ago, we abandoned our anti-monopoly policies. This has allowed a few corporations to amass extraordinary market power and wield it with impunity. We hear this every day from business owners. People like Ben Okafar, who owns the only pharmacy serving a large rural region of Maine. Okafar's family pharmacy is beloved by the community and busy as can be, and yet he worries that he's going to be driven out of business. And that's because CVS and two other powerful pharmacy benefit management companies control how much he's reimbursed for filling prescriptions. These companies also compete with him. He's watched as CVS has slashed reimbursement rates to independent pharmacies across the country and forced them to close. We've heard similar stories from craft brewers, like Bob Jensen, whose award-winning Argus Brewery in Chicago struggled to get space on, short, on store shelves because in his, in his region, distribution is controlled by Anheuser-Busch and Molson Coors. And there are many businesses that are blocked from being able to compete online because of Amazon's outsized market power. People like Doug Merdeza in Michigan, who launched an online business selling hair care products. At first he did well, he quickly grew to nearly 50 employees, but Amazon's dominance meant that he depended on its marketplace for nearly 90% of his sales. Taking advantage of this, Amazon began to ratchet up the fees it charges sellers like Mordeza. By 2020, Amazon was taking nearly half of every dollar his company earned in sales. These fees pushed his business into the red and forced him to lay off most of his staff. America has a monopoly problem. It has rendered our economy less innovative. It's fueled rising inequality and racial injustice. Concentrated market power has made the already steep barriers faced by black entrepreneurs all but insurmountable. As Chairman Byer noted, growing numbers, uh, many uh, black and brown communities lack basic services like grocery stores and pharmacies because of consolidation. The roots of all of this can be traced to the 1980s when the antitrust agencies and the courts made radical changes to our antitrust policies. They abandoned the longstanding goals of these policies and instituted a new framework known as the consumer welfare standard. It sounds benign, but this approach has blinded and enfeebled antitrust enforcement. It has out allowed, for example, large corporations to use their financial muscle to bankrupt smaller competitors and take market share without actually having to compete for it. This happens, for example, through predatory pricing, which involves selling goods and, or services below cost for a sustained period. We've seen Amazon repeatedly do this. It's a way that big corporations can win simply by being bigger. A small business might have a better product, but it lacks the financial resources to sustain similar losses. Predatory pricing was effectively legalized by the Supreme Court in 1992. We see this in many other ways. Um, our antitrust agencies and the courts have, for example, allowed vertical integration. I mentioned with CVS and Anheuser-Busch and how they've used that to block their smaller competitors from being able to compete. And third, and finally, the current approach to, has allowed a few tech giants to seize control of our online markets. Amazon so dominates online shopping traffic that retailers and brands must sell on its site to reach the market. But Amazon also directly competes with these same businesses. 
Amazon routinely uses its gatekeeper power to exploit the businesses selling on its site. It has spied on these sellers, appropriated their data, and copied their best-selling products. And of course, it pockets a growing share of their fees, as I noted. If Congress does not act to check Amazon's outsized power, we are effectively allowing Amazon to function as a kind of private government that regulates and taxes the nation's commerce and rules over those who engage in it. In my testimony, I outlined several uh, actions that I hope you will take, but I want to underscore particularly the importance as I close here of supporting the big tech legislation that's coming out of the House Judiciary Committee. It's the most important legislation in terms of restoring fair markets for our independent businesses. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Ms. Mitchell, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And now